Good morning. Hi, everyone. Oh, it's so nice to see you guys. My name is Ava Christian, and I am so happy to see you all. I'd like to welcome you all to the morning service. And today is going to be so, so special. We're going to have so much fun with each other. But before I start, I have to ask permission first. Is it okay if the presence of the Lord amongst you and everyone here and us, is it okay if we could share that presence together as a family, as a, as a community? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And so we're, we're going to start. Um, we're going to do a little warm-up because uh, I, I like to warm up. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're going to start off with Psalm 100, okay? Do you see Psalm 100 on the screen? There you go. It says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. So I know we're going through a pandemic, but um, it doesn't mean we can't make a joyful noise. So, Brother Jethro, if you can give me a, a nice beat so we can get everyone to be clapping. So everyone, can you clap? All right, that's good. Okay, doing good. What about stomping your feet? Can you stomp your feet? Yeah. How are you feeling? Feeling good? Good. Okay. All right. So remember this joyful noise when we're clapping and you're stomping your feet because in this worship set, we're going to go through so much worship. And you're going to, your spirit's going to be overjoyed and you're probably going to just want to experience the Lord. And by all means, remember the clap and remember the stomp. And that is what we can give to the Lord as well as the worship that you're going to be offering with him privately. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you have allowed to come forth today through this morning. Bless the people, bless the people online. May they hear your voice. May they hear your words. May they see the revelations that you want to behold today. We pray in Jesus' name. to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. His Drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance leads by heavy stone. Messiah still and all around. Oh,
Love. 
word for someone today and this is for someone who has a broken heart and for this person you are going through a lot of emotional pain right now and I'm very very sorry for what is happening to you right now and you have family and friends who love you and who are helping you through this season I can discern this brokenness is something you always want to remember in your heart. And this feeling of being vulnerable and then being hurt by someone you trusted is something you don't want to let go. And so to help show you that you're not alone, I'm going to ask everyone here and online, you could please help me reach out to this person by answering a question that I'm going to ask everyone. And the question is, have you ever had your broken heart? And if so, can you please raise your hands? If you could see online, almost everybody here is raising their hands. We've all experienced some kind of pain and suffering. And so while I too have a broken heart, I'm gonna share a story with you from the side of not getting hurt, but from the position of hurting others. You see, before I was a follower of Jesus Christ, I chose to leave my first marriage. And in the process of separating, there was a time when um, the husband, then husband and I had to drop our son. And as he was driving away, I could see him being so hurt and started to tear in his eyes. But me not being born again, not understanding what he was going through, I was only focused on me and what my journey was, okay? But fast forward several years, I came to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And in that time, the Lord has rebuked me. He has chastened me. He has taught me. He has redeemed me, and he has loved me. And in that time, I have fully apologized to my ex-husband and have accepted full responsibility for the failure of the marriage. But I share this story today with you in hopes that you will understand that the person who hurt you so much will be worked on from the Lord. He is working on them and there may be a day or not that you will receive an apology or an asking of forgiveness. And you may be thinking, no, no way. I will never, I will never forgive them. But before you make a final decision, may I kindly, kind ask for you consider this verse. This verse is from Matthew 6, 15. But if you do not forgive others for their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And with unforgiveness, I believe this creates distance between you and Father. And if this is what you truly, truly want, then I honor your choice and your decision. But if you want to try to forgive, then we can start right now. Heavenly Father, I pray that the hearts would be open for forgiveness for those who have hurt them and who have hurt them very deeply. I pray that those wounds will be mended and that all parties will have reconciliation and peace for their lives, for the rest of your life, my Lord, forever and ever. Amen. And so one step towards forgiveness is to come to the Lord. And as we come to the Lord, we can start with what he says, okay? In Psalm 104, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And so this next song, it is titled Gratitude for You. And throughout the song, I, I pray that you would hear these words and most importantly, give that unforgiveness to him. Oh, 
my words fall short I got nothing new How could I express All my attitude I could sing songs As I often do But every song I said And you never do so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is an hallelujah, hallelujah And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a hot king, hallelujah, hallelujah Just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is in Hallelujah, Hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing. Come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those eyes. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, come on, my soul. Come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those eyes.
verses in the song, he says, but every song must end and you never do. Years ago when I would be practicing and worshiping, I, I felt like I could never stop. I felt like the song was good, you, could, you can end it, but for me it was like, I kept wanting to play and play and play and I couldn't understand. I was like, why, why am I so drawn to just wanting to play? And then one day, I re I'll remember, it was here in San Diego. And the Lord was like, the reason why is because I am. And I was like, I am, I am. And then he says in Psalms 48, 14, if you can bring that up. For this God is our God forever. And ever he will be our guide, even unto death. And this revelation that the Lord is eternity. And then he says in Revelation, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Wow, now I understand why I feel like I can go on and on. Do you feel like that way too? Yes. <laughs> our last song for this worship set. Over that circumstance, over that. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just close your eyes. Fill your mind with God. Fill your heart with God. Every broken heart this day is healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Every vacancy of every heart right now is filled with Christ. Hallelujah. Every hand is now filled with praise and thanksgiving. Hallelujah to the God Almighty. We exalt you, Lord God. Greater is you than he Hallelujah in this, in this world. Lord, your name is above all names. And we cry out to you, Lord God. There is nothing greater than you. Whatever concerns, whatever problems, whatever cares that we're going through, Lord God. It is you, Lord God, that fill our hearts, Lord God, with joy and peace and victory. Hallelujah to your name. Holy is your name, oh God. Hallelujah. Fill this place. Fill the people in the living rooms, Lord God. Fill the people online, Lord God, with your praise, anointing, and thanksgiving, Lord God. Hallelujah. We declare your name, Lord God. Hallelujah. This week may be hard. This week may be difficult, Lord God. But we stand amazed because you care. You are our living hope. Hallelujah. 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 Declare it, church. Hallelujah, God Almighty. We will keep our eyes on you. Our hearts are resting on your love, oh God. And we will stand on your word, Lord God. Your promises are true. Holy, holy, holy is your name. Declare that now. Holy is your name. My victory is you. You have crowned me with life, oh God. Thank you. We will walk and not listen to the cry. We will not listen to the deception and the lies of the enemy. We will hold on to your promises because you are true in me. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. That's why, Lord, you've called us to sit at your footstool. To be like that of Mary. To be still. For these moments of worship, Lord God, that you remind us how glorious you are. That you are greater than every concern we face, Lord. Thank you that we can come as one family, as one body to worship you. And like that of a father who desires his children to be on that table when they eat. 
That is your desire that your people come together, Lord, so that we will encourage one another in praise and worship, that together we lift up holy hands, together we cry, together we declare that you are our healer. Father, thank you for this beautiful worship. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Hallelujah. Father, we pray for our tithes and our offerings. Thank you, Jesus, for providing for us. And when we look back, Lord God, to how many times you have kept us, put food on the table, protected our jobs, even through this COVID last year. You never fail. And so we always be generous in our giving, Lord, because you are such a generous God. Bless our givings to you for the expansion of your glory and the purposes and the operation of this church. More so, Lord God, may we just see the revelation of you providing for our needs as well. Thank you, Father, for these tithes and offerings. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me all sit down. Pastor Rick. Thank you, worship team, for ushering in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Well, I want to welcome our family, our church family, our guests here in the church and online this morning. God is good, amen? amen. You know, something about worship that just, uh, as we acknowledge that worship ushers in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this morning, uh, I've titled the message, uh, Hope Has a Name. I've titled it from a worship session our church had, uh, I think it was two weeks ago. I actually approached Sister Tessa after, and I said, can I get the, the words to that song? I was very touched and moved and blessed. So this morning, our message is Hope Has a Name. Will you please join me as we open in a word of prayer? Well, Lord, as we come before you on this Sunday morning, we acknowledge that today is a day that you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Yes. Speak to us this morning, Lord. And Lord, I pray that my words would be few and that your words would be many. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Well, I want to begin this morning... I'm going to take us back to the year 1972. It was in June of 1972 that I graduated from high school, Montgomery High School, right here in the, located in the South Bay. We got some Montgomery alumni here, yeah. <laughs> now, since the age of five years old, I was accustomed to the structure and routine of going to school. Now I was being awarded a high school diploma and introduced into the world. As many of you have experienced, that, that's a challenging place to be. A lot of questions are asked, so what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? What are your plans? I was hoping to find a job and a career path, but honestly, I had no real direction. Some friends of mine, they, were, they, were, uh, they had plans to be a school teacher and to further their education, and they pursued that. I didn't have that. Things were different in 1972. This is our next slide. The Vietnam War was coming to an end. And get this, the price of gas was 34 cents a gallon. <laughs> the average price of a home in the United States was $26,000. Times have changed, amen? And young people, 
I need your attention on this. I want you to listen very closely to what I'm about to share, which may be very shocking to some of you. In 1972, the cell phone had not been invented yet. <laughs> I seen a bag like, what? The world's first cell phone was launched in 1983. It was the Motorola Dynatech 800X. It was priced at right around $4,000. And it was almost the size of a foot-long Subway sandwich. <laughs> and if you notice, it says uh, the, uh, when it was fully charged, you had about uh, 60 minutes of time to use it. And it took 10 hours to charge. <laughs> Cell phones have come a long way. You, you walk by any high school, and it's going to be hard to find any student not with a cell phone in their hand. Amen? And unfortunately, you know, cell phones have almost become a mini God. I mean, I don't want nobody to raise their hands, but how many of us have uh, been on our way to church and realized we forgot our cell phones and we turn around and go back and get it, right? Let's keep it real here. Come on. Now, how many of us have been on the way to church? forgot our Bibles, and turn around to go and get it. Ouch. Yeah. Oh, no, I'll, I'll just read the scriptures off the screen, you know. But your phone, yeah, we've come a long way. We've come a long way. And on purpose, I left my phone in my backpack. <laughs> but I, I, I also have a cell phone, and I'm dependent on it. You know, in 1972, the word Google did not exist in Webster's Dictionary. Google was something you did when you saw a pretty girl walk by. <laughs> yeah. As I said, I think you would agree with me that a lot has changed since 1972. In August of 1973, I received an invitation that would change the direction of my life. My cousin invited me to go along with him to take a test for a government job at North Island working for the Department of Defense. At first, I refused. It was a Saturday, my day off. Go take a test? I said, nah, no thanks, cuz. And he convinced me, just, just, just go with me. So I went. We went down to the Naval Training Center. There was hundreds of people in the room. And me not being very optimistic, I just felt my, my hopes of getting a job was very dim. In August of 1974, exactly 12 months later, I received a three by five card in the mail. And the card asked if I was still interested in the job. I went for an interview and was hired. I ended up working for the Department of Defense for 38 years and retired in January 2013. In my 38 years of employment, I never missed one paycheck. God is good, amen? amen? I did not see it then, but as I reflect back on the past, I can see it now. The hand of God was in every part of my life, even when I was living in the world. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 it says, the Lord is not slow keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I am so grateful and thankful that God is patient and long-suffering. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, it says, therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you, Therefore, he rises to show you compassion, for the Lord is a just God. Amen. I'm going to fast forward about 20 years into my life. It's the mid-1990s. I accept another invitation. This invitation would radically change my life. 
The invitation was to attend a Sunday church service at Calvary Chapel, San Diego. Now, granted, this was not my first invitation. I had multiple invitations prior to this, to this particular one here. This would become my very first experience outside of the Catholic Church for me. And let, let me say this. At this time in my life, things were going actually pretty good in the world's eyes. As I mentioned, I had a government job. My wife was working for the phone company. We had purchased a home early in our marriage. We just purchased our, uh, a rental property, bought a new car. And I seemed to have more friends than I ever had in my life when I bought a beer tapper. There's something about having a beer tapper in a truck. You make so many friends. But in the eyes of the Lord, I was lost and in desperate need of a Savior. It was at Calvary Chapel, San Diego, under the leadership of Pastor Bryant Newberry, that I discovered that hope was not something that is tangible. I discovered that hope has a name, and that name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen? It is the name that I have put all my hope it is the name that I have put all my faith, and it is the name that I have put all my trust. It is the name that has changed me from being doomed to being destined to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords for the remaining days of my life. Amen. Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. It says, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait patiently for the salvation of the Lord. I discovered in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 12, that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And when I took that step of faith and I asked God for forgiveness, as we heard Sister Eva during that time of worship, I asked God for forgiveness. I repented of my sins, and I accepted his son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to testify this morning. My life has never been the same, and to God be the glory. In Acts chapter 10, verse 43, it says, All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen. And just once again, as Sister uh, Eva alluded to during the time of worship, if you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive. Amen? It matters not what anyone has ever said, done to you. If you want to receive God's forgiveness, we need to forgive first. In my humble opinion, there is nothing greater than to be forgiven by a loving, gracious, compassionate, long-suffering God. Amen? How many know, by a show of hands, that there is power in the name of Jesus? Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Let me repeat that again. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. There is power in the name of Jesus. And verse 7 says, taking him by the hand. 
he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Amen. The phrase in the name of Jesus is not a magical formula used to give some guarantee to a prayer. A person's name represented that person's authority and influence. The power in the name of Jesus comes from what the Holy Spirit will do because of that name. And hope has a name. Amen. Amen. Note that Peter and John did not lay their hands on the beggar and pray for God to heal him. Rather, as apostles, with the power of God to perform signs and wonders, they simply told him to rise up and walk. Luke, a physician by profession, described what took place. He said, instantly, strength was given to the portions of the body that needed it. Blood supply was increased to the muscles. The brain sent signals to the nerve endings of the ankles and feet. The hardened fluid between the joints was softened and the atrophied muscles and ligaments regained flexibility. The feet suddenly could bear the man's weight. The people had seen the beggar day after day and maybe even year after year. His healing was not a staged event. When the beggar stood and walked, the only reasonable explanation was that God had healed him. Amen? Amen. And now we, as we continue, we're, as we're going to see where Peter is going to speak to the onlookers. In verse 11 of chapter 3 in Acts, he says, While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made, him, we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate though he had de decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. By faith, in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Amen? Amen. Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. I'd like to share a quote from the legendary Forrest Gump. He says, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. I think a lot of us can attest to that. God never promised that putting your hope, your faith, and trust in him would be easy. But he did promise that it would be worth it. And what God has promised to you and I is literally out of this world. Amen? Amen. There's no one that knows us better than Inky Johnson. Inky was born in Kirkwood on the east side of Atlanta, a neighborhood surrounded by crime, drugs, and gang violence. Growing up in his grandmother's two-bedroom house with 14 people sleeping on the floor with roaches and rats. At a young age, he evaluated his surroundings and chose not to sell drugs or join gangs like his uncles did. He made the decision that he would go to the NFL in order to get his family out of their situation. Inky 
and his cousin would race each other every night on their street until one day they were spotted by a football coach who offered them free training. Next slide. Inky continued his training every day. And when practice had ended, he would be doing football drills alone in the dark. He was committed. He was dedicated. Throughout college, he was told by many that he was too small to join the NFL and that he would end up in prison like the rest of his family did. Not very, word, not, not very encouraging, the words he was being told. But through adversity and struggle, Inky Johnson had made it through college and received a call from his coach to say he was a projected top 30 draft pick and in one season, he would become a multi-millionaire. Amen? Amen? Hold on. Don't, don't switch yet. Don't switch yet. <laughs> I want to just share a little bit. I mean, you know, uh, for, for young, young folks, professional sports, football is a dream for a lot of young athletes. And when you're a football fan, you want your favorite players to be in the game for as long as possible. But when it comes to professional football, the average NFL career is not very long. Injury, skill, and personal reasons may sideline a football player much quicker than you may think. Listen to this. The average NFL career for all positions is only about two and a half years. Two and a half years. And here's a young man from the age of seven years old dedicating his entire life being focused, sacrificing for this dream. The average NFL career for a quarterback is three years. The average NFL career for an office offensive lineman is about three and a half years. The average NFL career for a wide receiver is a little more than two years. There are many reasons why NFL players exit the sport. As you can imagine, concussions and other neurological injuries tendon and ligament injuries, especially in the knees and ankles, and other health concerns. The average age of an NFL player is just over 26 years. 26 years old is the age of the person. However, with many players getting drafted during college and starting at the age of 20, an average three-year career means that they are done playing professional football by the age of 23. I think you would agree that's pretty young that leaves a lot of future career potential left for a young retiree and when the plan was to stay in the NFL for many more years after so many years of trying to get there it can be a huge disappointment it says that about 80 percent of NFL players go bankrupt or suffer financial hardship within two years of leaving the game. When, when the average age of an NFL player is 26, it makes sense that long-term financial planning wasn't on their minds. According to the calculations by the NFL Players Association, the chances of a high school player making it to the NFL are about 0.2%. Yet it is a dream of thousands, I would say millions of young boys professional sports and there's nothing wrong with professional sports but you also got to have a plan b amen? amen and you also have to be in tune is this god's plan for you the nfl recommends that any player who dreams of playing professional football should make other backup plans for an alternate career due to the low odds of making it to the profession professional level to play so, Inky Johnson, he's right there. He's in college. His coach notifies him that he's uh, projected to be uh, in the top 30 draft pick in one season, and he would become a multi-millionaire, be able to take his mother out from uh, working two shifts at Wendy's Hamburger Place. Next slide. He won his first game against the California Bears, and felt confident going into a second game against the Air Force Falcons. 
During this game, a routine tackle turned into a life-threatening injury, and his dream of playing in the NFL had been shattered. So he's, being, he's been ushered off in a, in a stretcher, and he's strapped down. Uh, if you look at his video, he's, uh, you see the hit, and as soon as he hits, you know something's wrong because he just goes limp. He goes down, and he doesn't get up. He's paralyzed. His players come up to him. Ink, come on, get up. We've got to finish the game. He says, I can't move. What do you mean? Come on, Ink. I, I can't move. They, they strap him. They take him out. His dad meets him as they usher him to the ambulance. And he tells his dad, hey, dad, I really put a hit on him, didn't I? He goes, yeah, Ink. But I think you got the worst of this one. They take him to the hospital. His mother goes into the room prays over him. She's a God-fearing woman. She says, Ink, you're going to be all right. Immediately after that, the doctors come barging in. The doctors and medical staff, we got to get you into surgery right now. You're going to die. If we don't do surgery right now, you're going to die. Well, he, uh, they were able to save his life, but he's paralyzed on his, uh, I think it's his right side, his right arm is completely paralyzed. His dreams were shattered of going into the NFL. He talks about that experience of his whole life passing before him. He's like, God, why, why, why now? Why couldn't I just fulfill my dream, get that contract, take care of my family, and then something like this happened? But God had other plans. He talks about his plans were for the NFL, but God had bigger plans for him. He says that uh, through that whole process, he was reintroduced to his uh, biological father, and he spent 30 days with him. His father offered to take him to, to school, to therapy, to a doctor's visits, and to church. I think he was a man of God. His dad would take him to church or to Bible studies, and his dad would wait outside the door. His dad was listening to the worship, the word, but he was outside the door. He'd come in and get his son and see his son at the altar praying. He saw his son's dedication, focus. He continued to work out. He's working out with one arm. He's doing all these calisthenics. He's going to school. He's inspiring his teammates. And his dad says, Ink, I want to get to know the God that you serve. And he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. And in the process, three of his best friends, football players, surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. Inky Johnson said, if I had to do it all over again, I choose the path I'm on now. The next slide. Inky is now a professional speaker, inspiring millions of people traveling around the world. And as his statement there, he says, what seems to us as a bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. Amen. And the next slide. And he goes on to talk about what happens when when God says no. And that's the scripture that uh, God spoke to him. He says, Ink, for I know the thoughts I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and the future. Amen. But it wasn't with professional football. It was to go out and to share the gospel around the world. Amen. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the life expectancy of a, a, the average of a football player is two and a half years. The average life expectancy of a minister of God is unlimited <laughs> until the day the Lord calls you home. You can literally be in a wheelchair on crutches. You can be confined to a bed. You can be in a hospital emergency room. You can be in intensive care, and you can continue to share the word of God. Amen. Amen. God has equipped and prepared each and every one of you for a season such as this. 
if you listen to Inky Johnson, I, I get inspired by listening to him talk. He, he's motivated. He's energized. He's, his one arm is just completely limp. It doesn't do anything. It's just there. But through that tragedy, God took him to a whole nother level in his walk with the Lord. And, you know, uh, like I say, there's nothing wrong with professional sports. Uh, a couple of, last weekend, I was at the, the ballpark watching our, our grandson play. He plays travel baseball, and I saw the Ascensions there, and they were supporting their son with travel baseball. And when you get into the, to the level of, of uh, travel ball, it, it's very competitive. You're not, your, your son or daughter are not guaranteed to play. The coaches, the managers, they want the best. They want to win at all costs. It's, it gets pretty intense. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with, with that. But I also believe that there needs to be a, the plans that you have for your future, for your kids. It's good to support sports. But I believe there's also got to be that backup plan. That backup plan should be the Lord. Amen. Because God will never, ever leave us or forsake us. And there are a few sadder things on earth than the sight of a person who has lost all hope. What may seem like a dead end could be the fast lane if you trust into the Lord. In difficult times, hope can be elusive, but Christians never need lose hope. After all, God is good, his love endures, and he has promised his children the gift of eternal life. And what can be better than that? If you find yourself falling into the spiritual trap of worry and discouragement, consider the words of Jesus in John 16, He says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. Pastor David Jeremiah writes, when something bad happens in the life of a new Christian, they will often say, Lord, why is this happening to me? When something bad happens in the life of a mature Christian, they often say, Lord, why is this happening to me? Same question, but different motivations. The new Christian may think it unreasonable that a bad thing happened, but the mature Christian knows problems are a part of life in a fallen world. His why question is to discern from God what he can learn from the difficult situation and how he might grow from it. Amen? And some of you are saying, man, I know exactly what that means because I'm going through it right now. I'm in the thick of it. Why? What can I learn from what I'm going through right now, Lord? You promise you'll never leave me or forsake me, but teach me, Lord. Teach me. It has been said that difficulties don't determine who you are. Rather, they reveal who you are. Said another way, the same heat that softens butter can make mud hard as a brick. It all depends on how things being heated respond. The same with the human heart. Difficulties can soften one heart and harden another. Amen. Amen. Nobody, let's be honest, nobody likes to go through trials or tribulations. And sometimes we think when we're a child of God, we're immune, immune to the, the trials and the sorrows. But that's not true. Christians, believers get sick. They get cancer. They get COVID. They lose their job. They lose their home. But God is still there. There's nothing you can compare in this world to the love of God. And God declares, he says, as we just read, you, in this world you will suffer many trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And he says, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, nor the fears of today or the worries of tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. And it is inevitable that the storms of life will come. Maybe you've been blessed up to this point. You've never really experienced any real trials or tribulations. Well, I don't want to discourage you, but they're coming. They're coming. And it's how you respond that will make all the difference. And Jesus, the name that is above all names, can calm the storms in your life. In Mark Chapter 4, verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, 
Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There, there were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we, are, if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Amen? Amen. You know exactly what this is like. You may be in that boat right now. The waves are crashing over you. The boat is filling with water. And you may be asking why, God, we're gonna, I'm going to drown. I'm going to die. And Jesus is right there next to you. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understandings. And God promises to direct our path. In the daily devotional titled Jesus Calling, Sarah Young writes, Do not be surprised by the fiery attacks on your mind. When you struggle to find the Lord and live in his peace, don't let discouragement set in. You are engaged in massive warfare, spiritually speaking. The evil one abhors your closeness to the Lord, and his demonic underlines are determined to destroy your intimacy with the Lord. Jesus said, when you find yourself in the thick of the battle, call upon my name. Jesus, help me. At that instant, the battle, Jesus says, becomes mine. Your role is simply to trust in me as I fight for you. Amen? Amen. Jesus' name properly used has unlimited power to bless and protect. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, we read, Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. People who have used Jesus' name as a swear word will fall down in terror on that day. But all those who have drawn near to Jesus through trusting in his name will be filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. This is your great hope as you wait upon his return. And we should think twice on who you bow your knee to. We are living in some different times. And in the eyes of God, every life matters, even the life in the womb. Amen? Amen. And hope has a name, and there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. When you have lost your job or your home, when your doctor informs you you have been tested positive for COVID or cancer, hope has a name. When your marriage is holding on by a thread, when your unmarried daughter informs you that she is with child, when you discover your son is experimenting with drugs, hope has a name. And that name is Jesus Christ the Son of the living God, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. I mentioned earlier in the very beginning that things were different in 1972. But there is one thing that remains the same, and that is the word of God and the promises of Jesus Christ. Amen. In Luke chapter 9, verse 19, one day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do people say that I am? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, 
And others say you are, you are one of the other ancient prophets risen from the dead. And then he asked them this question. And I'm asking all of you this morning. Who do you say that I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah sent from God. Amen. Before you can say no to the devil, you have to say yes to Jesus. And I'm going to close our time together with an invitation. An invitation that could change the rest of your life here on earth and in heaven. Will you please join me in a word of prayer? Well, Father, I, I come before you in need of a Savior. Lord, on this day, by my own free will, I ask you for forgiveness. I repent of my sins, and I accept your Son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. I thank you, Lord, for sending heaven's best to die for my sins. And Lord, I'm asking from this day forward that you would help me to live a life that gives you glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you have prayed that prayer, your name is written in the book of life. And whenever that day comes, that glorious day comes, when you are ushered in by God's holy angels to those pearly gates of heaven, your name will be written in the book of life and you'll be ushered in to God's presence. And I can only imagine, I long to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now enter into the kingdom, the mansion I prepared for you before the beginning of time. You fought the good fight, you finished the race, you kept the faith. Now there's a crown of righteousness awaiting you, which the good Lord, the righteous judge, will give to you on that day. And Lord, as we are here in this time of prayer, Lord, we acknowledge that you are the great physician, you are the healer, you are the comforter, and you are the prince of peace. And Lord, we lift up to you our dear brothers and sisters, sons and daughters who are going through affliction, who are going through sickness. Lord, you know every detail of their lives. Nothing is hidden from you. And I'm praying, Lord, by the power and the authority that is vested in me, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would place your healing hands upon that portion of their body, or maybe it's their spirit or their soul that is hurting, that is ill today. And I pray, Lord, that you would touch them, that you would heal them, and that you would comfort them like no one else can. And that through your healing powers, you would just encourage more people to come to know you in a very personal, intimate way. God, you are a loving God. You are compassionate. You are slow to anger. You are merciful. And your love is unconditional. And today, we are claiming healing. And today, we are claiming it in the name that is above all names, your Son, Jesus Christ, and our Savior. And we thank you, Lord, for sending heaven's best. And we love you. And we are careful today, Lord, to give back to you all the praise and all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you all. Let's all rise. Oh, praise will rise to Christ the King. Your name.
Every church. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. Is your prayer. All praise will rise to Christ the King. Your name, your name, your name is victory. And all praise will rise to Christ the King. Let's sing that one more time. And by your spirit I will rise. From the ashes of defeat, the resurrecting, the resurrected King. Oh, come on! He's resurrecting me. In Your name, I come alive to declare Your victory. The resurrected King is a resur resurrecting, and the resurrected. King is resurrecting me. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Praise you, Jesus. What a beautiful message. What a beautiful message. Truly, God spoke to us this morning. He led us into worship. led us to forgive others in our hearts and I know that some of you here are going to go home and you're going to ask forgiveness to those you've hurt or that you're going to forgive those who have hurt you to the message that there is hope in the name of God the name of all names what a fitting closure that's your name Lord your name brings hope. We thank you, God. We thank you. Let there be healing now and deliverance for everyone here and online. Be encouraged that you have heard from the Lord and he is encouraging us to call on the name of his son that we will be healed, delivered, and saved. Don't only use that only on certain occasions. Call on Jesus throughout the week. And every time you start feeling discouraged, you call on Jesus' name immediately. You mention his name. 
And when you're excited, go ahead and call on Jesus. For he is bringing joy in our lives. Whatever goes through your lives, you have the name of God at your lips. We thank you, God. We worship you. And we are so careful to give back all the glory, praises to you. All in Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen and Amen. for the message we had today uh, the power of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and I just want to share the miracle of our lives today is my 21st month of my surgery from cancer I had cancer of the tongue also lymph nodes they removed 21 lymph nodes on my neck so I'm so thankful 21 months that I'm still here and my husband as well because there's hope in the name of Jesus. That's what it's all about. And I almost cried when the pastor was talking about the hope in Jesus. So I encourage each and every one of you, always have hope in Jesus. My husband was also diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer. They said, he's not going to leave. Naval the hospital gave up on him. They didn't do anything on him. But by the grace of God, he's also is going to 28 months of his surgery. Because seven months after his surgery, I was the next one. Number seven is, I don't know what it's all about, but there is a God who is our hope. That what our pastor preached today is a powerful message. Don't lose your hope. There's hope in Jesus. He's the God on the throne. He is the God of impossibilities. He's our everything. Nothing is impossible with him because he's the resurrected king. When we have him in our life, we are glo we glorify him. We have victory because we have the author of life in everything. Surrender everything to him. Cling unto him. Cry unto him because he's the only one who could do everything for us. No one can take his place. Praise God. Thank you. That's was my testimony to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Praise God. Cancer Praise of God. the husband, her cancer, nothing is going to overcome the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. It doesn't have to be cancer. Something's going on with your family, with your daughter, with your son. Something's going on with your husband. Call on Jesus. All right. And don't give up. Don't give God a timing. Don't give up. But Lord, this is the way I want it. This, no, no. When you give it to the Lord, let Him do it His way and His time. Because He knows best. Amen. So let's all encourage. I would like to appreciate Sister Jen Polito for leading what she has done today with a team. Look at that. Uh, from the coffee shop to the entrance, to that, the clock at the back. I feel like I'm, I'm in a church coffee shop. And then after that, the team led by Brother Roger, Brother, uh, brother um, um, Nexter, and Brother Doug with the painting in the back and the, the, the crown molding and all that. Thank you. It's a live stream. Sorry that you're not here to see this, but again, uh, thank you. Your prayers and your giving. You can sit down if you want. Uh, your giving. If you can come back, those who've been in, in church or ha hasn't been coming back lately, you'll see the amazement. All the men's fellowship with the, with the stage, and then after that, with the brother, with, with uh, brother um, Jethro leading, and and, and uh, with the lights and all of this, with Conrad and and brother uh, and as well as the media with, um, with uh, Brian. All these slides, all this. We are improving church. And we are going to continue to grow. And if the Lord opens up another place for us, we're going to improve it as well. Because, you know, we're going to welcome everyone with this setup. 
to be comfortable, that you are truly coming to a, like a home. I feel like I'm in a home right now, okay, with uh, the fellow believers. The sound system, we have improved so many equipments, and we're going to be giving, getting new cameras, new cameras, probably two cameras that's going to improve the, the video for all those in live stream. We're going to improve on that as well. Again, um, we have a new barista, I think, with Sister uh, Jerty. And, and Sister Rowena, I think, will be helping out. I'm already calling out their names. But come earlier because the coffee's there and we can all fellowship before the worship. Okay? And then after the message, just chill out. There's coffee there. And perhaps in the future, we'll put some danishes or something, you know, uh, some snacks. Well, we are, before in the early years of SPA, we brought food in, in the morning, in the afternoon. We literally had fellowship almost throughout, uh, after the service. We're going to be gradually doing that, but you know, not, not, not anytime soon because of this COVID. But the goal is to welcome back the family because we had all year of being absent from one another. All right? So it's gradually depending on your comfort, okay? Whatever you are comfortable with, with your, the mass, whatever, bring it in. Don't, don't feel ashamed. Don't ever, no condemnation here. If you, you mass or, or not mass, go ahead because you, you have to feel and be comfortable with yourselves. All right? Say God is good. Amen. All the time. And if you need special prayer after this, you can always go to Pastor Rick, I, wherever we are. We can pray for you. All the elders, you know who they are. You go to them in prayer. If there is a specific need you need to pray for and you just need to be prayed for before you leave, go ahead and come to us. And wherever we are, we can pray for you. Okay, God's good. Noel. All the time. Noel. We love you, family. June 4th. And one more thing. Memorize this, June 4, June 4, every first Friday of the month, we're going to have worship here. And it's going to be pure worship. It'll be two hours of worship. Okay? But the special thing about June 4 is we're encouraging everyone who have cancer. If you have friends who have cancer, you have relatives who have cancer. If you have cancer and you're dealing with it, come here June 4. Because we're going to specifically pray for you as we worship God. It's going to be worship and healing. All right? Amen. And even if it's not cancer, whatever sickness you have, even if you're depressed, come. Because it's going to be a time of worship and just healing. The gift of healing, gift of prophecy, everything's going to flow on June 4, 7 p.m. Okay, 7 p.m. Yes, we're going to have coffee as well. All right? 7 p.m. Bring any of those that you that's going through cancer. Bring them here because we're going to put them in the middle. We're going to surround them and we're all going to pray a declaration of healing in their lives. Amen? June 4. Okay? 7 p.m. in this place. Friday. Thank you. God bless you all. Okay? Ella John. Hey, 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 hey. Ella John. You're my firm foundation I know I can stand secure Jesus, you're my firm foundation I put my hope in your holy word I put my hope in your holy word God has a plan for me Oh, this I'm sure of This I'm sure And Jesus, you're 
could stop the Lord Almighty? Who could stop the Lord Almighty? Yeah. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Come on, sing now. Yeah. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Brother June. Who can stop the Sounded good, bro. Maganda ang sa sound. I mean, even the in-ear. I mean, it was better than last week. <laughs> 